So we now put all the pieces together. Uh, we put the proportional piece and the integral piece and the derivative piece in, and we have the overall PID controller. In this case, our compensator, D of S, is equal to KP times 1 plus 1 over TIS. So the 1 is the proportional term, and the 1 over TIS is the integrator term, and the TDS is the derivative term. Or if we use this alternate formulation, we have uh, KP plus KI times 1 over S plus KD times S. Again, you'll see both of those in different textbooks. We need ways of designing the parameter values KP and TI and TD or KP and KI and KD in order to make the controller fit the application that we have in mind. Now there's some rules of thumb, and rules of thumb are great, but they're dangerous too. So here I say in general, and maybe I shouldn't even be that strong, maybe I should say very often, because this does happen often, but there are ways of, of um, breaking this. If I increase the proportional gain or the integrator time, that will make the error go down and it will make the stability of the system also go down. Um, but if I increase the derivative time, I will make the stability go up. So there's trade-offs um, in these, and so we can do some hand tuning using these ideas, but in fact we're not guaranteed uh, to have a great solution uh, just based on these rules of thumb. For the speed control problem of the DC motor that we've been looking at, we can uh, put this compensator in. So notice that U of T is the output of our compensator equals KP times the error plus KP times 1 over TI times the integral of the error plus KP times TD times the derivative of the error. And we can go through about a page of algebra and uh, put this into the transfer function of the, the plant and find the closed loop transfer function and solve for the poles. So I'll spare you the details. You're welcome to, again, do that yourself. But what we get for the closed loop transfer function is this. I've got something times s cubed plus something times s squared plus something times s plus something equals zero. Um, it's a little bit neater, perhaps, if we divide both sides of this equation by this leading term there, and we get this second form. Now, what, what this shows us, if you step back and look at it, is that with this motor example, my closed loop transfer function has three poles. Uh, I started with two, but I added one because of the integrator. Um, and so I've got a third order polynomial, and the roots of that polynomial are where the closed loop poles exist. Uh, so to design a controller, I might want to find values to put the roots of this polynomial somewhere nice in the S-plane. And we talked about that in the last chapter of having um, rise time spec and settling time spec and overshoot spec giving me uh, regions in the S-plane that were desirable that we could shade. And as long as we could get our poles in that region, we would meet the specifications. Well, notice what has happened here, something pretty interesting. Um, suppose I choose any old three poles whatsoever. There's a pole there and a pole there and a pole there. So I have a desired set of three poles to meet my specifications, and that would look like S minus P1, S minus P2, S minus P3 equals zero. That's my desired denominator. Uh, my desired characteristic equation. And if I were to expand that out, I'd get S cubed uh, minus P1 plus P2 plus P3 times S plus something, uh, sorry, S squared plus something times S plus, uh, I guess it's um, minus P1, P2, P3 being the constant. I'd get some polynomial there. And it, wouldn't it be nice if I could choose controller coefficients, controller values, so that I could put the closed-loop poles anywhere I wanted? And here we can. 
and that's what's really neat. So notice, uh, if I choose KP, that makes that term do anything I want. If I choose KD after I've chosen KP, so KP is fixed, that makes that term do anything I want. If I choose TI after the other two are fixed, that term does anything I want. So I've got, in this case, complete um, authority to move the poles of this motor example anywhere in the S-plane I want, and I've got complete control of the dynamics in this case, and that's pretty cool. The entire transfer functions, if you work through it, look like this. And uh, then I'm going to show you that you can plot this in MATLAB. Uh, the example is plotting this one. Actually, the example plots both, but the MATLAB code uh, shows you how to do that one right there. The other one is very similar. So in MATLAB, to, uh, to tell it about a transfer function, uh, you can give it a numerator and a denominator polynomial. So notice the numerator of that transfer function is something times s plus no units. So I would say that my numerator is equal to uh, ti times b uh, in the s uh, place and then 0 in the units place. And then the denominator, I would say, is equal to, in the sq place, is ti times tau 1, etc. And then you see the code on the next page to do that. So you just give it polynomials where uh, separated, the terms are separated by spaces, uh, and then MATLAB has a, a built-in step command that will take the numerator and denominator polynomials and give you step responses. So if we wanted to do the step response of y instead of uh, y versus r instead of y versus w, I notice the denominator is the same, the numerator changes, so for that one we would do numerator equals what multiplies s? Well, a times kp multiplies everything times ti multiplies s, and then I've got one units. And if I use that numerator with this same denominator, I could plot those step responses as well. So I've chosen some values for the, the uh, proportional integral and derivative gains and plotted some representative step responses of the controlled system. And on the left-hand side, what we see is when the reference input R of S is a step, that's 1 over S, and W of S equals 0, and on the right-hand side, I've said, well, at R of S equals 0 and W of S equals 1 over S. In both cases, we want the output to track R and not W. We want uh, the output to match the reference output, which is a unit step in the first one, or it's 0 in the second one. So let's look at how we do. So on the left-hand plot, the proportional controller is blue. And uh, the proportional controller has a little bit of overshoot, a little bit of ringing, and it settles down, and it's probably not too easy to tell, but there is some steady state error if you compare the red line and the blue line. The red line is uh, right, and the blue line is a little bit less than one. So the proportional controller has some steady state error um, when I add the integrator, I get the green curve, and not too surprisingly, the transient response gets a little bit worse. There's a bit higher oscillation, but the steady state error goes away. Uh, and then if I add the derivative term for the PID controller, I get the red curve, and the oscillation, there's a little bit less overshoot. In fact, the rise time is faster, there's less overshoot less ringing, faster settling time, no steady state error, and overall PID gives really great performance uh, when I'm trying to track the reference input. Let's look at the right-hand plot. 
So we're looking at the response when the reference input is zero, so I want the output to be zero here, but the disturbance input is a unit step. Uh, so this is uh, like my car going from zero grade all of a sudden to a, a non-zero grade, and how, what happens to the speed of the car. Okay, well, the proportional controller is the blue line again, and we see that the proportional controller does a great job of tracking the step, which is exactly what we do not want to do. We don't want to track the step. We want to track the reference input. Uh, so there's overshoot because of the step, there's ringing because of the step, and there's a lot of steady state error. I want the output to be zero, and in fact it's very close to one. Adding the integrator to the system to get the PI controller is again the green curve, and um, we see that the adding the integrator has gotten rid of that steady state error. So we saw it in terms of root locus before, now we see it in terms of time response now that the integrator causes steady state error actually to go away. Yes, the transient response still has some overshoot, yes, there's still some ringing, but ultimately, eventually, um, the steady state error goes to zero. And then adding the derivative smooths it all out. So that red curve is the overall PID controller. And yes, there's this initial response to this step um, while the controller is figuring out that, oh my goodness, something changed and I need to do something differently while it's integrating up that error. Um, uh, it very smoothly, because of the derivative, makes the error go away and it still ends up with zero steady state error. That's pretty characteristic of what PID controllers do in, in many applications. That's what they're supposed to do. But how do you make them do that? How do you design a PID controller? Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce uh, two different rules. And I, I have to caution you that these are rules of thumb. These are not anything that anyone has derived as being the best way of doing something or even necessarily a good way of doing something. But uh, there was a paper written um, quite a few years ago now by uh, Ziegler and Nichols where they did lots and lots and lots of simulations of different kinds of systems and uh, they came up with rules of thumb for selecting the controller constants of a PID controller that would work very well in many situations. So they haven't optimized anything. They haven't done any really hard math of calculus of optimizations and all of that, but uh, they've done some, some good work uh, that often gives results that are very good. So they have two methods. They have the Ziegler-Nichols method one and Ziegler-Nichols method two. If one doesn't work, try the other. Method one says, well, suppose we have a system that has a step response without a controller, just open loop, that looks like this. We know what to do about it. And the step response says there's initially a, a delay, this tau d here, where when I input a step to the system, nothing at all changes for a period of time. And then after that, there is an interval during which the output of the system changes, uh, basically like a ramp, and then the output of the system stabilizes at some final value, which is A. Now this is very common in some kinds of industries, like the chemical process industry. If I want to manufacture one chemical from uh, several beginning chemicals, uh, I, I put the chemicals into the pipes and there's a transport delay um, between when I put the chemical into the pipe and when it gets to the mixing area. And when it gets to the mixing area, there's some period, tau, over which the mixing occurs and some of the product is, is formed. And then finally, I get this steady state output after which the, the product is consistent. So in a situation like that, this type of uh, a step response would be very, very common. In our motor example, it wasn't quite like that, so we would not expect the Ziegler-Nichols method number one necessarily to work too well for the motor. Uh, what 
this, uh, this response can be approximated by first in Laplace domain, if you remember, if I multiply a transfer function by e to the minus tau ds, that's a pure delay in the time domain of tau d seconds. So that accounts for this transport delay. And then uh, the a is the final stable value, and the tau has to do with how long it takes to get to that stable value. So this is a first order system plus a delay um, that approximates this step response right here. The key point is I don't have to do a very complicated uh, mathematical modeling process to get uh, something that I can use to develop a controller. All I have to do is perform an experiment where I change the input and I measure this output, and from the output I say, well, the delay, the transport delay, tau d, from, from my measurements is so many seconds, and then the period of time tau until I get to the steady state or approach steady state is, is uh, tau, and then the steady state value is a. All I have to do is measure that, and I got three numbers, and I use that to design my controller, and that's pretty simple. In this case, Ziegler and Nichols said my criteria for designing my controller, what I'll call a good controller, is uh, when I control the system, I want the ripple in the output to decay uh, three quarters or um, to one quarter of its uh, previous value in one period. So here's the idea. Uh, if uh, this blue line is the, the ripple and a period then is measured from peak to peak, now technically, whoops, technically it's not a periodic signal because it doesn't repeat, but here we're thinking of the, the time the signal goes from one peak to the next peak is what we call, think of here as a period, and we want the error to go from its original value to one quarter of its original value in one period, and then in the next period to one quarter of that, and the next period one quarter of that, and so forth. So we want uh, basically to squash this ripple quite quickly. And they went through again, this is, these are rules of thumb, but they went through a bunch of simulations with a bunch of systems that looked like that, and they said these are the results that we recommend. We say if you're using a proportional controller, we think that you should use Kp equals tau over a times td. And that's it. And they said, but if you're using a proportional integral controller, we think you should choose the Kp parameter to be this and the Ti parameter to be that. Or if you're using a PID controller, we think you should choose the parameters this way. So again, all I need to know is tau d, tau, and a, and I can use this rule to tune a PID controller. And then from there, uh, usually this will work, uh, but maybe it doesn't work as well as it could. You can use this as a starting point and then adjust these parameters a little bit by trial and error to come up with something that might suit your particular application a little bit better. And they came up with a second tuning rule, and uh, this requires a different experiment in order to come up with the parameter values. In the first one, we looked at a step response. In this one, we configure the plant in a feedback loop with a proportional gain controller. And this here is our proportional gain controller. And the experiment that we do is we let the reference input be zero, uh, but we uh, keep on increasing the gain of the controller until we begin to see oscillations in the output. Now we'll see those oscillations because there's a little bit of sensor noise on the signal here, and that sensor noise is uh, going to feed this system even when the reference input is zero. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to find out, gingerly, gently, I'm trying to find out where is the stability boundary and as soon as I get a stable oscillation, I stop. I don't want the system to go unstable and break itself. But when I 
get that stable oscillation, that value of gain that achieved the oscillation is what we call the ultimate gain. It's the maximum gain that I could have before becoming unstable. From that, I have the ultimate gain, and I also have the period of oscillation. So P sub U is the period of oscillation when I use that ultimate gain U, KU rather. Those two numbers are enough to tune the system, the parameters, the PID parameters, uh, using the second method. And they said, okay, if you perform this experiment and you get this kind of oscillation, we recommend that you use KP is one half of KU if you're doing a proportional controller. Okay, that makes sense. It's less than the stability, uh, the instability boundary. Uh, it's partway in between. That might not be a bad number to use. And if you're doing a proportional integral controller, these are the values we suggest. And PID, these are the values we suggest. Again, these are starting points. Your system uh, may not work well using these rules, or it may work well. Uh, I've tried them both on the magnetic levitation apparatus in the lab. Uh, and I think that if you're in the lab section, 4530, that you also try them. And you'll find that one of them works on the lab apparatus and works quite well, and the other one doesn't. Uh, so that just depends on the application. And it's a starting point, at least, until we get to the more advanced theory later in the course that would allow us to design these a little bit more methodically. Before we leave this section, I also wanted to mention one practical problem when using integrator control. Um, and that's a kind of a real-world problem that you wouldn't get if you just thought about this theoretically. But uh, this integrator can cause uh, more problems than we've already suggested, um, supposing maybe that there's a saturation in the actuator. And what we mean by that is suppose that the actuator into the plant receives some control signal, which is U of T, and it goes into this actuator, which is part of the plant model. But the actuator has some kind of response that looks like this. As long as the input is less than maybe A and bigger than minus A, the plant gets that input unchanged. But if the input is bigger than A, it only gets a certain value. If it's less than A, it only gets a certain value. Uh, if we're using digital control, uh, very often the output of our controller is limited by the voltage range of our digital to analog controller. I can't go higher than the rail voltage on the D to A. And so anywhere between the rail voltage, I get a nice linear response, but beyond that, it saturates. And that's a problem, because integral control just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing harder to try to achieve its result. And if its result is not getting achieved, it's going to make this control effort get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means that on this picture over here, I'm operating more and more um, out of that linear region and finally into that nonlinear region. And once I get to this region, I can push as much as I want on the saturator. is just going to chop it off. And it's going to make the error not decrease, even though I think it's supposed to decrease. Um, and the integrator, because the error is not decreasing, the integrator is still integrating. And it's going to keep on adding error and keep on adding and keep on error. And the value, the internal value inside the integrator will just grow without bound. It will blow up. So the practical solution to this practical problem is to turn off integration when the actuator saturates. And we can do that in digital control with an if statement in a loop, which says if the output is bigger than a certain number, then stop integrating. Or uh, we could even do it in an analog controller by putting in a kind of saturation, really a dead zone, into our, a feedback inside of our compensator. So this is our controller here. Notice the input is error and the output is U. And ignoring the bottom block, I've got a proportional control, which maybe I should label KP. And then the integral control, KP over TI, and those are added together, and they perform the control effort just as you would expect. But what's happening 
with this additional term here is this is a dead zone term, which um, is feedback internal to my compensator. And this feedback, you'll notice if my control effort U is between U min and U max, the output from this uh, dead zone is zero. So I'm not changing the control effort at all. I'm subtracting zero from whatever I'm doing, and uh, I'm just getting the normal behavior of a proportional integral controller like I would desire. But if I get outside of bounds, if my control effort is bigger than k max or smaller than u min, then all of a sudden this control effort u gets magnified by a number that's bigger and bigger and bigger the farther I get outside of those bounds and I, pr I produce a larger signal here. If I'm a little bit out of bounds, it's a little signal which gets subtracted from the control effort. If I'm a lot out of bounds, it's a big signal that gets subtracted from the control effort. And this is a feedback controller inside of my controller that is keeping my U within bounds. And that's kind of cool. But it's a nonlinear thing, so it's a bit tricky to evaluate and analyze because of that dead zone in it. Doing this is absolutely necessary in any practical implementation. You will run into this problem, and so having the, this dead zone is helpful. So the problem with the integrator is it winds up. It just keeps on getting, it's like a clock. You're winding and winding and winding the clock, um, not realizing that you're going to break the spring, basically. So this is, it. this is the term. It's called integrator anti-wind-up to use this dead zone feedback in order to bleed off from the integrator the error so that we don't get outside of bounds. If we omit this, we get bad responses. We get unstable responses. Uh, and here is an example of a step response of a system uh, where there's a saturator, a, a saturation in the actuator, and what happens with the anti wind up, so with this uh, modification and without. Uh, so my my system, I'm trying to do a, I'm trying to do a, a step input to the system. I'm trying to do a step response. And uh, initially, I start out with um, y of t here being quite far away from the desired output. The desired output is 1. You know, I'm trying to track a step. I'm quite far away, so my control effort is going to be quite large to begin with. But looking over here on the, on the right, where I'm plotting control effort u of t, I'm saturating it. So even though it's quite large, it's getting limited in this case to a maximum value of 1. And what's interesting is this nonlinear limit puts uh, a restriction on this, so you get a nice linear slope here, actually, because I'm giving it a constant input up until a certain point in time. Now, with the anti-windup, uh, it recognizes, the controller recognizes that in fact, it is saturated, and so it doesn't keep on integrating this error. There's a lot of error in here. It could integrate all of that and get uh, quite a large number, so it doesn't actually into keep integrating that. And as soon as my error crosses zero, you'll notice over here my control effort also starts going down. It starts um, getting, uh, going the other way. And even starts, yeah, it goes negative down here, which is when we start turning the corner and going the other way, and we have a nice smooth response. When I did not have the anti wind up in there, I did keep on integrating the error, so I kept on integrating and integrating all of that, and that was part of the integral. And when finally I crossed zero error, uh, um, When I finally cross zero error, we see that I'm still going. Why? Well, my integrator still has a big value in it, so I'm still pushing very hard. Um, so I need a lot of this negative error to deplete the integrated positive error that's in my integrator. And only when that's depleted, which is way out here, can my control effort, uh, does my control effort start going down and cross zero and go the other way. So... 
in summary, without the anti wind up, I get a lot more overshoot, I get a lot more oscillation, and it's a lot less stable. Uh, with the anti wind up, it uh, behaves much more like I would expect the system to behave. So that concludes our look, uh, our preliminary look at this point at PID controllers. Uh, what we're going to do for the remainder of the chapter is look at other aspects of dynamic response when I use feedback controllers and how the controller can improve that and some ideas for designing a controller to do that improvement.